Well, welcome everyone to Equitable City Making by Design. Thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to have tons of people calling in to hear from our esteemed guest, Christopher Hawthorne. Before we get started, a couple shout outs. First, thank you to the San Diego Design Week staff for putting together an amazing lineup of events this week. This particular event is being supported by AIA San Diego and the Regional Design Advisory Council. I'm going to hand it over to Lee Eisen, Executive Director for AIA San Diego, to say a few words. Thanks, Heather. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to be here. AIA San Diego is a local nonprofit component of the American Institute of Architects, which was a group that was established way back in 1857. So we host events and programs and tours all year, all, all year long. So if you want to learn more, you can please visit AIASanDiego.org. And one of the many things we do is advocate for the design profession. To this end, we've established a working group to bring together interdisciplinary professionals to discuss policies and projects that affect the built environment and our region's future. Um, our AIA San Diego Director of Advocacy, Katie Chard, serves as the group, as the chair of that group, and I'm very pleased to introduce her now. Thank you, Lee. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Heather and Megan, for bringing us this great event. Um, as Lee noted, I serve as the chair of the Regional Design Advisory Council, or sometimes known as RDAC. It's a big tent of interdisciplinary individuals, including but not limited to architects, urban planners, landscape architects, and regional and local governmental officials. As a collective, we seek to promote visionary design thinking and serve as an advocacy group, as Lee mentioned. Um, if you have not yet been to one of our meetings, I encourage and invite you to get involved. You can find out more information about our group on AAA San Diego's website. And with that, I'll send it back to Heather. Thanks, Lee and Katie. So I'm Heather Resick, an associate at the Miller Hall Partnership, and my colleague, Megan Groth, who is the director of practice at Woodbury University. We've been working together over the last several years to advocate for bringing design into the conversation with our local government. We believe that design can play a pivotal role in how we approach issues of equity and environmental justice in the built environment. So together, Megan and I lead the Design Governance Subcommittee under the Regional Design Advisory Council. And we invited Christopher Hawthorne here today because we believe that what he's doing in LA could be a model for how we here in San Diego can better integrate design into decision-making and planning to ensure more visionary, cohesive, and equitable outcomes in the future. We're honored to welcome him here today. And in case you haven't heard of him, Christopher Hawthorne is the Chief Design Officer for the City of Los Angeles, a position appointed by Mayor Eric Garcetti in 2018. In this role, he provides design oversight for major projects and city departments and develops initiatives related to housing, urban design, infrastructure, and public art. Prior to joining City Hall, he was architecture critic for the Los Angeles Times from 2004 to early 2018. I'm sure many of us have read his articles. His writing has also appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Harvard Design Magazine, and many other publications. He's a member of the English faculty at USC, where he teaches courses on writing and criticism, and he directs the third Los Angeles project, a series of public conversations about architecture urban planning, mobility, and demographic change in Southern California. He's also taught at Occidental College, UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism, Columbia University, and the Southern California Institute of Architecture. A frequent collaborator with KCET-TV, the PBS affiliate in Los Angeles, he also wrote and directed the hour-long documentary, That Far Corner, Frank Lloyd Wright in Los Angeles, for which he received an LA Area Emmy Award. He's been a mid-career fellow at Columbia University's National Arts Journalism Program and a resident in criticism at the American Academy in Rome. Christopher is going to give us a 40-minute talk today, followed by a short moderated Q&A from Megan and I, before we open it up to all participants for questions. We will be using the hand raise function if you do want to ask a question at that time. Uh, and with that, we welcome Christopher here to San Diego. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you so much, Heather, um, and thanks to Megan so much for the introduction. Thanks to AIA San Diego. Um, I'm gonna get right into it because I do wanna save some time for conversation. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, about um, a select number of projects, which I think give a sense of the, 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 um, the most important initiatives. 
um, that I have worked on in my in my time in the in the mayor's office, um, and then very much looking forward to a conversation um, about what's happening in San Diego and I think connections between between the two cities. Um, so as uh, as you heard, I've been in this position for just about four and a half years now. Um, the mayor uh, created a new position called chief design officer and asked me to take it in early 2018. And I had gotten to know the mayor um, in my capacity as architecture critic and having um, actually the roots of this position really go back to a series of conversations that the AALA chapter held with the various mayoral candidates in 2013 when, when then council president Garcetti was, uh, was running for mayor for the first time. We continued some of those conversations after he was elected um, in some uh, public forums at Occidental uh, college and that led to a series of conversations about uh, what became the chief design officer position. So this position is based in the mayor's office. I work very closely with uh, city council offices and a number of city departments. And in fact, the, uh, the chief um, power of the mayor's office is that convening power to work across departmental lines. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, this afternoon. Essentially, my job is to provide a kind of design oversight for uh, major public and some major private developments as well as developing new initiatives to promote equitable, effective, and sustainable design. And that uh, includes designs for the public right-of-way, public art, as you heard, shade equity, which we'll talk a little bit about in climate change, uh, monuments, memorials, and civic memory, issues related to procurement, selection of architects, and design firms for public projects, as well as housing. In terms of what I'll talk about today, um, a couple of overarching themes I'm going to focus on uh, equity and community engagement, those issues will be threaded, I think, throughout my remarks this afternoon, but I'll talk specifically about initiatives in three policy areas that we have launched directly from my office, um, a couple related to housing, a number related to civic memory, and finally, um, a number related, uh, related to climate, and then, as I mentioned, looking forward to um, saving some time for conversation. In terms of that first category, housing, um, most of you will be familiar with this image, which I think really encapsulates the really central place that the single family house and the single family house that is detached from the life of the rest of the city has held in the public imagination of Los Angeles and ideas of what uh, defines Los Angeles uh, for, for many, many decades. And that plays out not just in architecture and architectural photography, but also in artwork by, uh, by figures like David Hockney um, and others who, who helped give the single family house, not just a central, but in certain ways an exalted place um, in LA civic identity. And we have long seen the single family house as a, a locus for experimentation and expression, perhaps the, the supreme uh, site of that kind of personal expression by architects, particularly when they're uh, designing their own residence, as the, is the case in this Paul Williams house in Lafayette uh, Square in Los Angeles, and of course, uh, Frank Gehry's uh, house in Santa Monica, which he um, bought as a, as a kind of modest uh, pink Dutch colonial on a corner lot in Santa Monica and remade in successive waves of experimentation by wrapping it in uh, corrugated metal and chain link. Um, but housing also became, single family housing became a kind of infrastructure in Los Angeles. It became a way of building out an entire region as this picture of Lakewood um, suggests. And that has left us now with this map of the city of Los Angeles where uh, the single family zone neighborhoods are in magenta um, and uh, multifamily in, uh, in gray or blue gray, which gives you a, a sense of the wide swaths of Los Angeles, particularly in the Valley and the Northern uh, parts of the city that are still dedicated um, exclusively with some recent exceptions that, that we'll talk about to single family zoning. There is, despite that, um, a really uh, rich, if in some ways unheralded history of multifamily experimental innovative housing going back to work by actually preceding Irving Gill and think of, bung of bungalow courts in the late 19th century, but then really accelerating with the work of some pioneering uh, modernist architects, Gill, um, uh, and Schindler and Neutra in particular um, that uh, suggest an alternate history in, in, in terms of this dominance of the single family paradigm that I mentioned. Um, and there's also a history of, um, of redlining, of, of uh, racist and racial, racially exclusive lending 
and zoning practices that we have to grapple with when we think about the role that the single family house has played. And that dominance of the single family house and an expectation about what certain neighborhoods uh, will look like and how they'll be designed um, really began to have policy implications by the 1970s and 80s. Um, there was significant multifamily construction in the post-war decades that prompted a kind of backlash that uh, led to the so-called slow growth movement in Los Angeles, which led to the down zoning of zoning capacity as the uh, Greg Morrow, um, now at UC Berkeley, uh, famously illustrated in his dissertation at UCLA um, uh, to take a city that had been zoned for a population of 10 million down to a population of just about 4 million um, by about 1980 or so. Um, and that has had a specific uh, impact on housing production in Los Angeles and really tamping down. Um, it used to be that uh, high housing production really tracked with uh, population boom. So in the 1920s, we saw significant population influx and also significant housing production. The same was true in the immediate post-war uh, decades of the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then because of those slow growth movements, as you'll see toward the right side of um, uh, of this chart, uh, uh, much, much lower levels of uh, housing production relative to, um, to the city's population, which um, has everything to do with the housing affordability and homelessness uh, crisis that we're experiencing in Los Angeles as in so many other cities, which has led to this real crisis, of course, of affordability, which I know is an issue that you're grappling with in San Diego as well. So that really leaves us um, from a policy point of view uh, with a, a tricky set of questions. Um, uh, every city, big city in America is thinking about um, uh, zoning reform in single family neighborhoods, but the problem is, is particularly complex in Los Angeles given um, the central role that we've been talking about that the single family house and the architecture of single family architecture has played um, in the 20th century. Many cities of course are beginning to think about creative and innovative ways of developing additional missing middle infill housing and we, um, when I started in City Hall, wanted to think about some ways to advance the conversation um, in Los Angeles. And, and uh, just a couple of, of um, thoughts here about the themes that guided the a couple of initiatives that I'll be talking about um, in the next couple of minutes. Um, many of the benefits of low-rise infill housing had really long been um, under-researched um, under encouraged by policy and underrepresented in debates about the future of the city. And I think more to the point, there had been really a disincentive for elected officials to step out into this territory. So it was really the future of single family zoning was really seen as a kind of third rail political issue. Um, uh, elected officials, starting with the mayor, but including a city council members, of course, um, saw only downside uh, when they were thinking about the prospect of uh, of stepping into that territory and talking about the future uh, of those neighborhoods in broad terms to say nothing about specific zoning reform. And there have meanwhile been significant concerns within a number of our communities about uh, the potential negative impacts of new development and rezoning, particularly as it relates to displacement. Um, and there is a long legacy of eroded trust in terms of um, uh, whether new changes, investments, development, uh, or zoning reform and what it would mean for existing communities of color um, in particular. Um, and so we felt that without a really concerted and inclusive local effort um, to guide discussions about uh, housing policy that centered communities of color, really thought about an equity framework is central to this work. Um, it was very unclear how to move that work forward. And so we really thought um, about the initiatives that I'll be talking about in that light. And of course, all of this is happening in the context of debates in Sacramento about changes to statewide housing policy, as you in San Diego, of course, are well aware of. Um, and a lot of uh, zoning reform that addressed single family housing in particular in low rise neighborhoods um, had really foundered on opposition that came from Southern California in particular, and from lawmakers representing both the kind of expected opposition to that kind of reform from uh, suburban, um, typically white homeowners, um, but also very strongly from communities of color, which had, I think, good reasons to be um, doubtful about what that reform might mean. Um, and that was true of a number of bills that cycled through Sacramento. So the major initiative that we launched um, to address this, uh, this web of issues really was um, a design challenge that we call Low Rise Housing Ideas for Los Angeles. 
um, which was meant to uh, enlist architects and landscape architects in producing new uh, prototypes for low-rise housing that could help us imagine new futures uh, for single family and other low-rise uh, residential neighborhoods across the city. And I wanna talk in particular about the engagement that we did, the outreach at the beginning of the process as we were organizing the design challenge um, produced a lot of feedback that we got um, that design competitions in general often um, uh, are seen to have a troubling dynamic where um, ideas from architects who maybe live outside of neighborhoods or outside of the city altogether are imposed on communities. We really wanted to turn that dynamic inside out. And so we, before we um, wrote a design brief, before we thought about the scope of the project, we started with community engagement and we organized a number of listening sessions on um, themes related to key issues, cooperative land trust, new uh, models of affordable housing, uh, financing and lending questions, sustainability. And we made those um, uh, listing sessions required viewing for anybody who wanted to uh, enter the design challenge. And so we wanted um, both local architects and those who were entering from further afield uh, to really be grounded in the issues that communities were telling us were important. Uh, and we wanted all of that discussion from the very beginning to inform uh, the responses that the architects produced. And we also, I don't expect you'll read every name on this list, um, but we had a very wide ranging kind of expertise that was brought to bear in four different juries. So we had four categories in the design challenge, seven jurors in each of those categories. So 28 uh, jurors in total, um, including not just architects and my colleagues at City Hall, but also a number of affordable housing developers and a number of folks uh, representing community land trust tenants. Um, and others who brought a really different kind of perspective than is typical um, in typical design competitions uh, and, and conversations among jurors that I'm sure many of you are, are, are familiar with. And when we then got the entrance, we got nearly 400 in total, all of whom had watched all of those video sessions, about nine or 10 hours in total. We were really thrilled uh, with the level um, uh, of entries um, this image is from the um, uh, winner in one of the categories where he asked entrants to think about combining two single family lots and distributing eight to 10 units across, uh, across that territory um, by Von Weisenberger, a, a young Brooklyn architect, which really speaks to this idea of community that we wanted to engender uh, in the designs. Um, this is a design for a, a, a fourplex um, by the LA firm um, Givening, working with the landscape architect um, Mia Lair and her office. Um, uh, the design challenge received a great deal of both uh, local and national press and was really central to our strategy to really change the conversation about the future of single family housing, again, with uh, uh, responses from communities and particularly communities of color at the center uh, of, the, of the kind of ethos of the project as a whole. The second housing initiative I wanna talk about briefly is related. We have been very supportive in Los Angeles of changes to accessory dwelling unit uh, laws at the state level, which began in 2017 with streamlining from Sacramento. Uh, we've seen ADUs become um, about 20% of our annual permanent housing units now on a consistent basis over the last three to four years. Um, and we developed something with our Department of Building and Safety called the LA, the ADU Standard Plan Program, which is essentially a kind of design pre-approval program of the kind that exists um, in a number of California cities. Um, we enlisted uh, a number of local and other architects to work with us in a pilot program to develop a number of designs uh, which would be pre-approved and added to a list of approved standard plans on the Department of Building and Safety website, which we launched uh, last year. This is uh, one of the designs by Linda Tallman, which has proved among the most uh, popular um, in general, the designs that are kind of in the sweet spot that are modular, uh, but also have some design personality have been uh, among the most popular. Um, and we are now seeing the construction of the first wave of, uh, of these standard plan projects um, in support of um, that, that larger or successful ADU program. Um, so uh, the Low Rise Design Challenge and the ADU Standard Plan Program were both organized anticipating that finally there would be a breakthrough at the state level. And indeed, uh, finally, uh, Sacramento um, State Legislature did approve um, two uh, state housing bills, SB9 and SB10, which allow 
um, uh, multi-unit projects in single family zones. Um, and uh, that has allowed us to think really about how this work now moves forward, not just in terms of ADU production, but really taking the lessons of the low rise design challenge and applying them to uh, the territory opened up by these new state laws. So in terms of the role that our office and, and, and design in particular plays in this, uh, in this policy debate, we really see the power of, of good design is in helping communities imagine uh, and really illustrating the benefits that new housing options can bring. Uh, those include support for multi-generational households, aging in place, uh, affordability and flexibility over time. Um, I think the, the pandemic has really clarified a lot of this as well, that people really want to be within a larger supportive residential complex or compound, but they also want the ability to work from home or to quarantine in a separate uh, and quiet space. And we don't have a lot of housing options right now that enable that kind of flexibility as well as walkable neighborhoods in the so-called 15 minute city. Um, and then support for things like local retail, we had a category um, in the design low-rise design challenge that uh, required architects to really think about uh, including some kind of small-scale rescale retail, um, which is very much in parallel with um, our community plan updates in the planning department, which are now beginning to re-legalize uh, corner stores in certain neighborhoods across the across the city. And finally, this work together, all this housing work, the low-rise design challenge, the ADU standard plan, uh, this other work has been now funneled into um, uh, a project that will that will live on in the Department of City Planning as the Low Rise Design Lab. So we're able to secure half a million dollars in initial funding in this year's budget uh, for a kind of design studio within the Department of City Planning, which will begin to extend standard plan um, and, and other case study uh, best practices into um, not just uh, second units, but but into third and fourth units enabled by a new sta state housing laws as well. Uh, the second category I want to talk about today is, uh, is civic memory um, and the work that we have done um, looking into Los Angeles's, let's say, particular and peculiar relationship with history and its own past. Los Angeles, of course, has long thought of itself as a city of the future, and one of the things that has attracted and continues to attract creative people to the city is uh, um, the idea that Los Angeles is always looking forward, um, as suggested in this Ed Shea piece. Uh, for the 1980s. At the same time, that has left significant blind spots in our understanding of our history. Um, there has been a lot of boosterism and myth-making in terms of how we have told the story of Los Angeles that leaves out a lot of difficult, fraught, and painful moments of our, of our city's past. This is one example of photograph uh, showing part of the so-called Mexican repatriation, where in the depths of the Depression, a number of cities across the Southwest including Los Angeles, uh, forcibly repatriated hundreds of thousands of Mexican and Mexican-American uh, residents, many of them born in Los Angeles, uh, because they were seen in really bigoted terms as being a, draw, uh, a drain on, on resources uh, during the, the Depression. And it's an episode that many, even many students of Los Angeles history are not uh, aware of. So we brought together a group called the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Working Group in the fall of 2019, which included uh, more than three dozen historians, indigenous leaders, artists, architects, a number of colleagues from across the city and other community leaders to explore one key question in particular, what new policies, outreach, or institutions might help Los Angeles commemorate its history more fully, I would say, and honestly, especially where that history is fraught or has been whitewashed or buried in the ways that we were just talking about. Of course, this was part of a national conversation about Confederate monuments and the fate of memorials across the city, but we really wanted this discussion to be tailored for Los Angeles. Um, and we were really guided by uh, something that, uh, a quote from Isabel Wilkerson's great book, Cast. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, um, why am I, as a white Angelina, for example, responsible for the sins of uh, my ancestors or predecessors um, uh, who um, uh, we're responsible for racist acts that are many, many decades, if not centuries in the past. And I really like this metaphor of the house, which is that as uh, Isabel Wilkerson puts it, we have inherited a house. Uh, we may not have caused that damage, but we are heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. And any further deterioration in, the, in this kind of civic foundation is in, in fact on our hands. We really proceeded 
and the civic memory work with that in mind. Um, we are also responding to some events that were happening while the work was ongoing. Uh, the death of the rapper Nipsey Hussle, for example, um, prompted this remarkable memorial um, next to his marathon clothing shop um, in South LA. Similarly, the death of Kobe Bryant in early 2020 uh, prompted a number of, uh, of uh, quite extensive organic and, and really community-based uh, bottom-up memorials across across the city, as well, of course, as the responses to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and, and we, it helped, I think, that we had established the goals of the work um, before 2020, when the world really changed in so many ways, the pandemic as well. Um, but we, of course, were responding also to the ways in which people were in the streets demanding uh, a broader reckoning um, by Los Angeles and other cities with, uh, with our own history, particularly in terms um, uh, uh, of racism. We talked a lot in the group about the ways in which uh, we remember history and, and understand the city in different ways in Los Angeles than in other places, uh, particularly in terms of mobility. And, and we all I think recollected the importance of the, the, the uh, slow motion parade of the, uh, of the space shuttle as it traveled from LAX to uh, its home at a museum at, the, uh, at Exposition Park, the California Science Center. Um, and all of that work um, uh, produced uh, a final report and recommendations that we entitled Past Due that was both a print volume and a website, which um, uh, you can, pardon me, you can find um, at civicmemory.la. That report had 18 key recommendations focused on policy and particular issues, as well as subcommittee reports, number of excerpts, roundtable discussions, but we also wanted it to be an editorial product that would be worth writing, uh, reading uh, and keeping in its own right. So we commissioned a lot of new writing and photography and we, um, uh, the mayor launched and endorsed um, the, the recommendations in, in April of last year. Some of the key themes to emerge from uh, this process include thinking of the city as a facilitator rather than a gatekeeper of civic memory foregrounding attention to process and community outreach, which I'll talk about in a second, and really thinking of the report not in a prescriptive or doctrinaire sense, but instead a kind of a guidebook, um, giving institutions, departments, a real sense of if they are addressing these issues, what are the questions to keep in mind? What are the processes that some of their peers in Los Angeles and in other cities have found useful um, in guiding uh, this work forward in a really equitable and inclusive way? Um, so that has spun off a number of ongoing projects, memorials to victims of COVID-19, which are being developed in Los Angeles. Uh, we are working with our um, tribal leaders to rename uh, and establish the city's first ind indigenous cultural easement at what used to be known as Father Sarah Park. So we, we um, heard from a lot of tribal leaders that the name Sarah, as I'm sure is the case in San Diego, um, brings um, some painful associations for indigenous communities in particular. Um, so we're establishing a cultural easement at that park um, that will give priority access for use of the park uh, and that public space to uh, tribal communities, which we hope will be a first step in the direction of full land return uh, and an important uh, um, test case of, of some of the work we hope to do in the future. Um, working to embed historians and indigenous leaders in a lot of planning for open space projects, which has not been typically the case. Um, and what I wanna talk about a little bit now, a project that's moving forward quite quickly now, a memorial to the victims of the 1871 Chinese massacre, uh, which um, killed uh, roughly 10% of the Chinese population, uh, almost 20 victims uh, in October of 1871. So we have worked with our Department of Cultural Affairs and a steering committee of Chinese American leaders, which ultimately numbered uh, more than 75 members to develop a request for ideas, uh, which we have just released. I encourage any of you architects and artists on the call who are interested in participating to find this request for ideas on our Department of Cultural Affairs uh, website. We also wanted, as with civic memory, we wanted the document itself um, to be reflective of our ambitions. We worked with an AAPI-led design studio in Los Angeles, Folder Studio, to develop the graphics um, uh, and the visual language for the RFI and the various social media assets uh, as well. So that process is 
uh, well underway. And again, it was the it began as Low Rise did with uh, really extensive community engagement over um, over nearly eight months, um, starting with the steering committee uh, of Chinese American leaders. We went to them first and said, "How would you not just what how you imagine?" Uh, uh, memorial ultimately looking what form it might take, but really asking a lot of very specific questions about process. How would you like us to go to the community of artists and architects and solicit ideas? Um, what, what should we, how should we frame uh, that process and that outreach? And we got really nuanced, sophisticated responses back from that community engagement. And finally, uh, we have been hosting in collaboration with some of our partners at USC, a number of conversations about important and difficult uh, moments in uh, the city's history. For example, um, thinking at the 30th anniversary of the 1992 uprising and riots, um, following the acquittal of the officers who were um, charged with beating Rodney King, how the city should remember and commemorate that difficult moment in its history as it was um, marking its, its 30th anniversary. The final category I wanna to touch on briefly and then we'll um, uh, move into some discussion uh, is some initiatives related to climate, climate change, uh, in particular in the role that um, design work uh, can play in framing some of these really important and crucial issues. Uh, the first has to do with shade and shade equity in an era of climate change. Um, this uh, image I'm sure will be familiar to anyone who spent time in, and not just Los Angeles, but any car-centric uh, American city that was um, really developed um, in its post-war uh, shape around uh, auto mobility. We have not left uh, a lot of room for shade in this landscape. Um, and as, um, as climate change accelerates um, the lack of um, those spaces of respite within the public realm become all the more glaring. And we have organized a number of conversations and design initiatives around this set of ideas, really noting that as the temperature warms Shade is something that really increasingly activates, organizes, and validates public life in a number of ways. And that lack of shade increasingly devalues um, that public life, which is quite a change in a city in Los Angeles like San Diego that has really organized itself around a benign climate um, that's really shifting in Los Angeles, particularly in neighborhoods to the east away from the ocean. Really beginning to think about shade as infrastructure and shade as an equity issue has been important to this work because anyone um, knows that wealthier neighborhoods in Los Angeles um, tend to have more shade, particularly in residential areas. And there are all kinds of reasons for that going back to some of the redlining uh, that is inherent. That redlining map that I showed in the housing discussion uh, is it, it doubles really as a kind of shade map as well. The places that have had less investment um, and have been more open to multifamily housing uh, and are denser, tend to have less shade, whereas um, uh, ironically enough, are uh, less densely populated and wealthy residential neighborhoods have more shade despite having fewer uh, residents per square mile. Uh, and this has really begun to um, infuse every bit of our work, um, even a competition that we organized for a new streetlight for the city. And by the way, these uh, streetlights are now moving into the prototyping phase, which we're quite excited about. There's money in the Bureau of Street Lighting budget to, to, to produce the first prototypes of this new design, uh, which is by um, an LA-based art and design collective called Project Room. Uh, we actually asked all of the entrants in this competition to include a shade a structure element uh, in their thinking about the role that a new streetlight could play in the city. It really is true in our development of, of new housing projects and in new open space are really threading uh, questions about shade and shade equity into every one of those. And the final project I'll talk about briefly, which has to do uh, also with climate change, is really thinking uh, what one of the, I think, roles that I have found to play as chief design officer in coordinating the work of many departments is really seeing where we were lacking a kind of foresight and looking um, ahead of the curve a little bit and thinking about issues that will be really pressing in the years and decades to come. One of those is what to do with the um, nearly 650 gas stations that we have across um, the city of Los Angeles as we look ahead to the end of the sale of uh, gas powered vehicles in the state by 2035. Again, as with state housing policy, we were trying to get um, ahead of the curve 
um, and thinking about what state changes in policy would mean for um, facts on the ground, as it were, in terms of urban design. So we organized a symposium with um, a half dozen invited architecture firms, along with uh, USC and the LA Cleantech incubator, Lacey, in a symposium we called Pump to Plug, um, where we spent the better part of the day hearing proposals for, uh, from a number of architecture firms about this transition. So first, what is the future of gas station sites? Could they be uh, re, uh, rethought as housing or open space uh, or some of each, given, of course, the need for envir environmental remediation at all of those sites? Uh, what, is a what does a charging station look like in terms of its urban design? How is it different and similar to a gas station in terms of the role it plays? Uh, in the urban fabric? And finally, how can we think about the transition to electrification at the ports and in particular uh, um, uh, charging stations for long haul trucking, uh, which is such an important part of thinking about environmental justice in the neighborhoods um, around the port of Los Angeles, which have been so deeply impacted um, uh, by the presence of the, of the port and diesel emissions in, in particular. And in terms of equity, uh, and community engagement, one of the most fascinating, compelling proposals was from Jeffrey Anaba, um, a Los Angeles and, and New York based architect who suggested that maybe we shouldn't be too quick to think about um, uh, tearing out gas stations that um, separate from their role selling gas. Many of them in communities of color play um, an important role um, as community centers. Um, um, they play a public space role, a gathering role. Um, and we should be thinking about keeping that role while, while uh, thoughtfully transitioning away from the sale of gas. Um, so really trying to maintain the role they play um, in supporting community um, in, in certain neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Um, so I think that uh, pump to plug, those pump to plug proposals that we had from those half dozen firms have really begun to shape how we're thinking, uh, particularly at the city planning side, um, uh, what our long-term strategy might be for in um, what will really be the blink of an eye by 2035, thinking about the transition um, to, to uh, total electrification in terms of um, uh, personal vehicles in, in the city. Um, so I will leave it there um, uh, in terms of um, uh, my slides, and I look forward to um, uh, your questions and, uh, and conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Christopher. That was fantastic. Um, and I know I have a lot of questions. I think Heather and I are going to kick it off with a few kind of, uh, you know, yeah, so comments and also just, yeah, open questions that then we'll transition to have a Q&A um, with all participants. And once again, when we get to that section, um, please raise your hand so we can unmute you and have you ask Christopher um, a question. Um, so what I love about how you, not only the work that you and your team have been doing, but also how you present the work is the very deep engagement with culture that you have done, uh, culture and history, um, and trying to show the connection and unravel, you know, the complexity of how they relate in the built environment and, and actually how quite direct there is a relationship in many cases um, and incorporating that in the work that you do, and therefore that in how policy is thought of, um, and thinking about, you know, this design as a civic project, as, as building um, a better Los Angeles, not, not physically in the built environment uh, only, but also, uh, you know, an electorate, a group of people, a community. Um, and so, you know, in terms of your role in this process, you know, how, how receptive what was the process of being kind of the first chief design officer and having this vision um, with this team to work for and working with the city departments towards um, these goals and these initiatives? You know, did you find, how did you find that working environment, I guess, is mm -hmm. the broader question. No, it's a great question. And, and first, a couple of thoughts on that, on that, um, your point about, about history. A lot of that goes back to, of course, the, you know, my work as an architecture critic and my work teaching uh, and running the third Los Angeles project and really thinking about the ways in which um, a longer sense of our history should be informing you know, our policy decisions. And I think in all of the initiatives that I talked about um, in that presentation, 
there's a balance between really understanding the peculiarity of Los Angeles's, you know, uh, particular relationship to these issues and the ways in which Los Angeles is emblematic of issues that all kinds of cities, San Diego and many American and global cities are thinking about. So in terms of housing, in terms of history, in terms of climate, there are ways in which we really needed to ground it um, in LA's particular relationship to those issues, but also understanding the way, and I think the, you know, the transition of gas stations is a great example. On the one hand, we have um, uh, gas stations like the single family house have been a real place for uh, experimentation and innovation. They have been in some ways a kind of Los Angeles building type, even though of course they are universal and, and ubiquitous around the world. And at the same time, this transition to electrification is something that every city government is thinking through. Um, and so it, it really was, you know, striking that balance, um, uh, learning from Los Angeles' own history and from other cities where appropriate. In terms of the larger approach, you know, I got to know the city, I got to know the mayor um, and the structure of city government pretty well as a critic. Um, I had a sense, I think, of where I might find allies and where there might be some minefields. But of course, everything looks very different once you're really in City Hall and on the other side of things. Um, so I tried to not come in with too many um, hard and fast rules about the work that I did wanted to do. I certainly had goals. I certainly had many conversations with Mayor Garcetti about what the scope of work might entail. I think I quickly um, uh, understood that um, I was going to have to divide my time between, as I mentioned, a kind of design oversight on the one hand um, and launching new initiatives where I could move into territory where maybe I was uniquely equipped to broaden or extend or, or um, deepen the conversation in other ways. So the design oversight takes all kinds of um, forms, but typically um, there I'm one of uh, many, many members of, uh, of city government across many departments, including other mayor's office colleagues working on projects. And my goal, and I'll give a couple of examples, um, is to really elevate the role that design plays um, in those projects while also realizing the limits of, of the role that design plays at the same time. So one example of that is um, we, our city council has just approved a new street furniture contract for the city where we will be uh, rolling out um, several thousand new transit shelters across the city. My role in that process with, again, a cast of uh, many, many dozen ultimately collaborators uh, and colleagues um, was to begin with the procurement document itself, the RFP um, that we were that the that the city council um, uh, gave city departments the green light to develop, and really make sure that we could carve out a role for good design um, within the parameters of that project within the specific procurement language of that RFP, and that meant um, signaling in all kinds of ways in the language itself, in the legal language, in the framework, in the in the selection and scoring rubrics. Um, but also in the public outreach and the community outreach to the design community, that design was going to be something that was important and central to the process. Um, and the uh, design team that was approved um, is Skidmore, and Merrill, working with a larger consortium under a group called Transito. Um, and I really think that uh, SOM probably would not have been attached um, to the project if we hadn't sent those signals about the role that design would play. So that's just one example. And then you know, I, I was at a conference once with a number of city architects or folks who have some version of my role. Uh, and there was a city architect, I believe, from Brussels, where they've done some actually pretty cutting edge work and thinking about urban design and the equivalent of a chief design officer. Um, and that city architect um, told us something that really struck, you know, stuck with me. He said, you know, sometimes we're working on a civic project and we're trying to take the design level from a you know, from an eight to a nine or a nine to a 10, but sometimes we're trying to take it from a four to a seven, you know? Sometimes we're trying to take something where design was not part of the conversation at all, and we're trying to elevate it um, without, you know, necessarily thinking that this is gonna be a, a cutting edge or world beating uh, design project, but it will be uh, more equitable, more efficient in terms of its design. Um, it will be more um, uh, publicly welcoming in all sorts of ways. So really, um, you know, thinking about um, being realistic about one's goals. And then finally, in the new initiatives, it's really about, again, thinking about these roadblocks or sticky issues that were tough to talk about, the future of the single family house, the relationship of Los Angeles to those painful moments in our history and how they're reflected in the design of the public realm. And I think in that sense, my role and my team was uniquely 
um, positioned um, to help carve out some new territory for the city to talk more openly and productively and some ways more honestly about those issues. That's great. That's very interesting. You know, um, we've talked a little bit with you about kind of the the role of design or where, you know, things, does, what we would call design governance is, is a blanket kind of word for things like design review, design guidelines, design advice, advisory committees and such um, in San Diego. And, and just um, compared to other cities of our size and of our stature, you know, just the lack of um, kind of across the board, um, unfortunately. So, you know, thinking about your position and, you know, especially five years into it and towards the end of your tenure, how, how do you see the effectiveness of, of your position within the city, um, you know, in the way that it was structured for you and how you and uh, Mayor Garcetti structured it, um, and then also knowing what you know about other cities as well. Um, you know, are there kind of lessons learned uh, or, you know, advice that you would give to uh, a city that does not currently have any of the structural foundation um, to support <coughs> design excellence Pardon the way that other cities do? I think something similar is true in Los Angeles. We, we have not historically had a culture of particularly strong design review. Um, and there are good and bad things about that. I think some architects would, would argue that having um, lack, a lack of those strict rules has really opened up space for innovation. Um, so any kind of um, new parameters of design review or oversight have to be balanced against a, a real tradition, productive tradition in Los Angeles of um, experimentation that we want to continue uh, to protect. Um, and as an interesting counterpoint, I live in the city of Pasadena and I was invited by the mayor of Pasadena to join the design commission in the city of Pasadena, which I did uh, and spent a couple of years doing. And one of the reasons I did that is to compare. Pasadena has a very strong tradition of design review. I think some architects would say perhaps too strong. Um, and I really wanted to understand how it operates in Pasadena and what the role uh, going forward would be for the, for the city of Los Angeles. Um, so I think it's some balance between the kind of lack of, or the kind of openness or perhaps free for all, which we had had in certain ways um, and a really you know, strong kind of design review in, that you see in a city like Pasadena or Santa Barbara, where almost every project above you know, a certain size is getting seen by the design commission. We don't have an equivalent commission in the city of Los Angeles. And so my, I think my overall sense of lessons learned as it relates to design oversight um, in, in the city of Los Angeles um, is that we really need to tailor it um, in a way that will serve. I think, I think historically it, it has not worked for all involved. It has been ad hoc. There's been design review that happens in some small neighborhood commissions or subcommittees, um, occasionally at the council level and occasionally at the planning commission level. Um, but I would say both for applicants developers and architects on the one hand, they have not felt that there is a predictable process. On the other, I don't think in terms of design outcomes, um, we have had historically a particularly good track record. So I think um, uh, a more targeted approach um, is warranted and an example that, that I think would be useful in Los Angeles and in a city like San Diego is focusing on a particular building type, for example. So I think there's opportunity in Los Angeles going forward to establish specific design review uh, and design guidelines for tower architecture, for example. So we have not historically had a history of experimentation or innovation uh, in our skyscraper or vertical architecture. So most of the innovative architecture has been in the single family house, as I mentioned, or in smaller scale um, uh, projects or in civic projects that uh, were let's say horizontal or mid-rise going back to the uh, first half of the 20th century, there could be, I think, a very specific um, set of guidelines and goals for a new generation of vertical architecture that might bring some of that experimentation and design ambition and quality into, let's say, what it might mean to create a very specific Los Angeles high rise. And that could be applied to other cities like San Diego. What would it mean to have a tower that really specifically reflected San Diego um, in the way that we can think of Chicago or New York uh, towers that really embody or reflect that city and that don't really exist in Los Angeles to the same degree. I mean, I can think of City Hall and a couple of other examples, again, from the pre-war period, but from the post-war period, it, it would be hard-pressed to think of a, 
a, a kind of a landmark example of vertical architecture. So that, that's just one example where I think there's a, there's a, a, a good deal of potential. These are all great ideas and opportunities. I think there's so much room in San Diego for something to be implemented. You know, like you're saying, starting incrementally. It's like, we wanna do it all. We can't just do it all. We gotta start little by little, but um, you've given us some great ideas to think of today. We also have our world design capital designation coming up within a few years. So design is definitely on everybody's mind, including those within the mayor's office here in San Diego and city government. Um, so we're grateful to be inspired by you today. I think we'll open it up to some general questions from uh, the participants. We have a chat in the Q&A from Roger. Um, he's first asking, how do you deal with tensions between design and engineering? Um, great and tricky question. Um, I, I think the, you know, um, one piece of advice that I got early on, which was very useful and valuable for me is someone said, you know, to me that when I'm dealing with, um, with city departments, particularly on the engineering side, um, that a lot of folks who work on these issues and have a career work on these issues are really thinking about two issues, um, more than any others, and those are maintenance and, and, and liability, uh, which is to say, how is something going to be maintained uh, and what are the legal um, kind of exposures that the city needs to be thinking about in terms of adding elements to the, to the public realm or to the public right of way. Um, and so, but we are, we are lucky in Los Angeles to have a Bureau of Engineering, which has a long and rich tradition of actually thinking in quite ambitious ways about design. Um, which, which does remind me that another way to address the question of, of where I see the role of, of this kind of position, uh, where I see the value in this kind of position, um, being located in the mayor's office as, as my uh, position is, um, really gives a unique opportunity to think about collaboration among departments and kind of in, interdepartmental work. Um, and departments in Los Angeles as in so many cities can be very much siloed um, and not necessarily in conversation with each other, particularly as it relates to design, I would say. So just a, a recent example of how we've really tried to use that convening and interdepartmental perspective um, to move some uh, design work forward is we are, like many cities, thinking about formalizing our outdoor dining uh, policy, which um, emerged as an emergency order in the middle of the pandemic as a way to help restaurants when indoor dining uh, was prohibited altogether. Um, we're thinking of um, making that permanent with an ordinance. And so I convened a working group of representatives from a number of city departments, including engineering, department of transportation, city planning and others um, to really think about some design um, standards and requirements that might be part of that or attached to that new ordinance. Um, and so that was a way to really bring experts in particulars of this question um, to the question about engineering, but also safety, um, relationship to transportation policy, and really thinking now that we're making this permanent, um, it is a, if we think about in-street dining in particular, this is a significant change in how um, the city has thought about making space in the public right-of-way available to private business, right? And also there's some changes in terms of um, the pressures on restaurants, um, they now can do indoor dining again. This is really a potential expansion of their business, but it's been hugely popular both with restaurant owners and with the public. And it's something we very much want to extend and make permanent, but it, it seems fitting that we could ask a little more of the restaurants in terms of design. Um, so we convened this working group to put together a very straightforward list um, of design standards, which we will send to the Board of Public Works for approval. Uh, which will include some um, uh, some standards with an eye toward improving the kind of consistent uh, design look uh, of those uh, outdoor dining installations. Um, and I think that's been an example. And one I'll give one specific example of how this plays out because I think these details um, I have learned are, are quite crucial. Um, the one of the great appeals, uh, you know, one of the things that made the, what we call El Fresco or outdoor dining program popular with restaurant owners was how simple it was, how straightforward it was. We've really tried to bring that same ethos to the design standards. So we're creating a kind of yes, no checklist that is very straightforward 
um, that uh, restaurants will submit as part of their application to the Department of Transportation for a permanent alfresco or outdoor dining approval. Um, and it just says, you know, does it ask a series of yes, no questions? Does the installation do X? Does it do Y? Does it do Z? Very clear in terms of the expectations that city policy has for restaurant owners and uh, with an eye toward improving design. So the structure, the form, and the language of this policy can be often as important as the design standards um, themselves. We're grappling with similar things down here. It would be great to see that document when you have it ready. I'm gonna go over to the chat and Jonathan French has his hand raised. Hi, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Christopher, for an excellent presentation. Um, I wanted to ask a quick question. Um, in the past four years working as CDO um, and taking a Big Ten approach that incorporates multiple perspectives and stakeholders in your initiatives, uh, were there any unexpected breakthroughs where specific community groups or non-design professionals informed discussions about the design and the future of the city? Um, do any of those groups now have a permanent place at the table? Um, if it were up to you, who would you grant a permanent place at the table? And then similarly, were there any unexpected obstacles or entrenched interests that you encountered? Thank you. Two really good questions um, to, to, to take the, the um, community voices question first. Yes, I mean, I think in all of the initiatives that I talked about, particularly um, the housing work and civic memory, uh, we have found that really foregrounding this community work has really changed um, the shape of the projects and, and, and really in some very positive and productive ways. Um, so to give a specific, specific example from housing, we found that there was, um, even, in, even in neighborhoods where there was a, a lot of support for additional density and zoning reform, adding housing units in single family neighborhoods and low rise neighborhoods, um, there was concern, a particular concern about losing tree canopy um, in an era of climate change in a city where so much of the tree canopy, as I pointed out, is on uh, private property and the result of, um, uh, of residential planting rather than, let's say, planting in the public right of way. Um, and so we heard a lot of feedback, which really shaped our design brief for the low rise design challenge about ways to um, incorporate additional units while protecting that existing tree canopy. Um, and that is now informing the, the policy work that is going to happen at the, at the planning department as it relates to this low rise design lab and um, our interpretation at the city planning level of, of SB9 and other new state housing law. Um, it has also been very, very important to the civic memory and in particular the 1871 um, uh, work. And I'll give another specific example of that uh, one of the so we broke the 1871 steering committee, which, as I mentioned, was about 75 um, leaders in, in Chinatown and in and around El Pueblo and uh, downtown Los Angeles to ask them not just kind of what a memorial might look like, but how the process should be shaped. And um, we broke that group into a number of subcommittees who um, looked at questions of design selection, site selection, community engagement, and outreach, um, and so forth. And in the site selection subcommittee, we, we were asking them um, very uh, specific questions about where the memorial might be located. And we got a really nuanced, as I said, and surprising set of um, responses back, which said, um, we want on the one hand, one primary location for the memorial, which will be suitable for gathering and public remembrance. Um, but given the way that that massacre played out, which was across pretty much the whole geography of Los Angeles as it existed in 1871, we want that primary site to be supported by a number of secondary sites, um, which could be connected in a linear distributed model or through an audio or a walking tour um, to tell a fuller story about the massacre. And not just in terms of violence, but also in terms of uh, more encouraging stories. Um, for example, um, there are a number of sites of sanctuary where um, uh, LA landowners, including a very prominent judge, uh, at the time opened their, um, their property up to Chinese who were fleeing the violence and, and, and turned their properties into sites of sanctuary. And it was very important, we heard from the community that those sites be marked um, as, as potential secondary sites for the memorial as well. So I think I'm most interested in terms of seeing the responses we get to this request for ideas, um, how that plays out. Um, 
in terms of your question about, and, and just a final thought on that, there's sometimes a, a feeling that community engagement and participation can dilute design ambition. But I think what we have found is that if we're very thoughtful and careful and intentional about how we structure the engagement, that it actually can provide a foundation for designs to be all the more ambitious and indeed to protect the ambition of, of design. Um, and, but part of that is being very um, specific and strategic about uh, where community engagement makes sense and where um, uh, handing processes off to design experts in the design community makes sense. So again, to use the 1871 Chinese Massacre Memorial as an example, we really front loaded the process with community engagement, which, which helped us shape this uh, brief and the request for ideas. When the responses come in, we will um, hand the job of choosing a short list over to uh, a, a, an evaluation panel, a jury of design experts um, who bring specific expertise, design architecture and public art and civic governance to bear. Then we will choose a short list of up to five firms. We have money set aside to give them all a stipend to make a public presentation. So we will then take their proposals back to the community, get another round of very carefully structured community engagement, then take their um, uh, second round proposals back to the evaluation panel again, where we have carved out space uh, that is protected for a very design specific conversation with design expertise to happen. So again, we think designs can be all the stronger and more ambitious if that engagement process is very carefully uh, structured and thought about. In terms of the second question you asked, the entrenched entrance, the uh, interest, the answer is absolutely. Um, uh, I would say um, particular, particularly in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, some of the kind of expected obstacles that I would find, the politics on the city council, of protecting, let's say, homeowner prerogative in wealthier neighborhoods continues to be very well entrenched. One that surprised me, though, though perhaps it shouldn't have, is the various ways in which protection of, of parking is entrenched in, in policy. Beyond just parking minimums for um, new development and things that I had written about as an architecture critic, but in some surprising ways. And I'll give two examples. Uh, one is that I didn't realize that the California Coastal Commission, perhaps again should have, really sees parking access to the coast as very central to its mission in protecting um, and opening up to uh, public access the spaces along the coast. So um, there's one uh, site in particular that's within a Coastal Commission territory that the city identified for a new permanent supportive housing proposal where we were turning city-owned parking lots into uh, permanent supportive housing. It seemed like the ideal location. These are um, city owned parking lots, surface parking lots. There's no concern about displacement of existing residents, um, property that is clear of development and owned outright by the city. Um, but because of coastal commission requirements um, and minimum parking requirements, we had to protect the, we had to protect the existing parking uh, for access to the coast. And we had to add new parking for residents, even though many of them will not have cars. Um, so uh, um, to be quite frank about it, um, that uh, project became a, basically a delivery mechanism for a parking structure wrapped with a rather thin exterior veneer of housing. Um, um, and again, uh, I think having a broader conversation about perhaps some tension between environmental policy as it was developed in the 70s and 80s and the beginnings of the environmental movement um, that really saw car, private car access to the coast as central to an environmental mission um, could, need some, uh, could need some updating. And the other example I'll give is that there are times when city departments themselves in protecting uh, private parking access for their own employees have wound up being an entrenched obstacle in terms of um, promoting either open space or new housing and, and adding to the cost of that. So where you have city departments who have um, who have employees arriving by private car, that becomes a very entrenched special interest that again, even in uh, sites that are owned free and clear by the city, we find we have to pay a, a significant premium to protect existing, um, existing parking access. Interesting. So uh, we're gonna pull a question from the, probably one more, one or two more questions, uh, pull one from the Q&A. And Bill Anderson asks, um, within the bureaucracy, who has the lead in designing the streets? And how are you and other design-focused departments involved? Advisory only? 
Really, really good question. Um, there are places where we have been able to bring some coordinated um, design strategy to bear on on streets and the public right of way. One is the is the STAT program I mentioned and the associated shade structure program that we are rolling out. Um, we're able to explore some of that work with the uh, with the street light competition that we organized with the Bureau of Street Lighting. Um, but I would agree that this coordination. Um, uh, is an area where we could absolutely improve um, the, and there is still a number of siloed aspects um, of this work. Um, we have uh, begun to bring together some thinking about how to enshrine a more coordinated approach. I think the great opportunity in the, in the specific Los Angeles um, example is the arrival of the Olympics in 2028. Um, we, um, are hosting the Olympics for the third time after having had the Olympics in 32 and 84. Um, and our pitch to the IOC was really that we didn't have to um, produce any new venues because we have quite a collection of venues um, and some new ones coming online between now and 2028. Um, and that means we don't have to think about producing new architectural venues and we have an opportunity, it seems to me, to think about um, a design legacy that will be left for the citizens of Los Angeles after the Olympics that is specifically focused on streetscape improvements, connectivity, equity within uh, the public right of way, not just connections uh, between one venue and another, but really um, on major uh, boulevards or connective um, streets across the city. And that ties in very directly, which is where the opportunity comes in, it seems to me, to the legacy of the design uh, strategies for those earlier Olympics. So both in 32 and 84, we had a design strategy that was very much focused on streetscapes, on corridors, and improvements to the public right-of-way. So in 1932, ahead of those games was the first time that we planted palm trees in a systematic way along the boulevards, whatever we think about palm trees now from an ecological point of view. Um, that was an important um, uh, use of landscape design in the public right-of-way in a coordinated way to um, to really rethink the design of our streets. And uh, we renamed um, 10th Street Olympic Boulevard. Olympic Boulevard um, was given its name ahead of the 32 Olympics because um, uh, 32 was the 10th Olympiad. So we changed 10th Street to Olympic Boulevard. In 84, similarly, the work that, uh, that uh, uh, John Jurdy, Deborah Sussman, and Paul Prasia oversaw was very much about a kit of parts which could be used to really build kiosks and gateways at, let's say the threshold between a uh, street space or public right of way and Olympic space. Um, so it seems to me that there is an opportunity looking ahead to the 2028 deadline uh, to really think about a coordinated uh, strategy to remake the streets with shade equity, with transportation, with mobility in mind. But again, to be candid about it, it's going to require a very ambitious um, funding strategy. It seems to me that we need to be thinking about some kind of assessment or bond measure that is specifically uh, targeted at, at that coordinated streetscape improvement, which then theoretically could be guided uh, from a design point of view from the mayor's office. Um, uh, we have had uh, bond measures uh, or tax hikes to fund a very ambitious transit infrastructure improvement through Measure M and Measure R, uh, bond measures at the county level for LAUSD for the construction of new uh, campuses at a county level for library branches, um, I think, and for housing now with, um, with uh, permanent supportive housing bond measure called Measure Triple H, which raised $1.2 billion in subsidies for permanent supportive housing. It seems to me that the missing piece of the puzzle in terms of funding at a large scale um, civic improvements needs to and must be focused around streetscape improvements. And it must include a very specific strategy for how to coordinate that design work across departments um, so that the work that BOE, our Department of Transportation, our um, Streets LA, uh, Department of Sanitation, and other departments do can be uh, more coordinated, but it will, I think, need to start with and be centered around a, um, a very ambitious funding strategy, it seems to me. Well, we are running out of time and we have a couple unanswered questions here, but I think we're just gonna take one more. Um, I'm gonna read from Ron Morello. Uh, with the fast tracking of residential housing in LA, have you found design has moved down in priority and your ability to provide guidance? Is there, can you flesh out the question a little bit or I don't know if- Yeah, um, I, 
think what he's probably getting at is housing is going up really fast in LA as it is here in I San see. Diego and his design kind of just is the quality of design going <laughs> down. So I think the the way that I've thought about this most directly is um, thinking about the most ubiquitous building type in terms of uh, multi-unit housing in Los Angeles as in San Diego, um, which is so-called five over one or wood frame um, over a concrete parking podium, um, which is the, the most common a residential type that we have seen really mushroom over the last decade or two, really flowing mostly not just from building codes, but, but from fire codes. Um, so that's um, uh, the, you know, a five or six story building is the tallest you can build in a wood frame because essentially that's, uh, that's as far as the, um, as, as the fire, ladder, fire department ladder will, will reach. Um, another example of these kind of public safety um, guidelines, some of them outdated kind of really directly shaping the architecture and design of the public realm. Um, so I... Um, came into this position thinking that we needed to, to really move past that building type. But I, have, I, I think I have a more nuanced uh, set of feelings about that now. I think there are certain neighborhoods, parts of the city where we should really be supporting that kind of construction because it is the cheapest and most um, efficient to build. It's the, the building trades know how to put it up. It moves through the city process most efficiently. So on certain, let's say, um, uh, medium density corridors in the San Fernando Valley, for example, I think that's a perfectly appropriate building type. We should not be doing um, that kind of, um, let's say type five construction in, in uh, downtown uh, where we're still doing it in Los Angeles, where we really do need, I think, to be requiring type one construction. Um, uh, so I think there is a real opportunity in the next five to 10 years to think about that. I think the way forward is very much through mass timber um, and CLT projects, which um, provide um, uh, an opportunity for higher rise construction that is more sustainable than a steel or concrete framed, uh, let's say, residential tower. So, our, our you know, I have discovered that our, that our building um, safety department, our plan department is very much open to a conversation and even a test case um, about a CLT structure. Right now, we only allow and have approved a hybrid CLT. So there's a project going up in Chinatown now by Lever Architects in Portland that is steel frame with um, a, a hybrid CLT structure um, uh, for, for floors and walls. Um, but we really need to be moving more directly to a full uh, CLT structure as a way, I think, to untangle this knot and move past the, the five over one um, ubiquitous uh, residential type. And that's an example where I think in shaping and opening up uh, the city to approving CLT projects um, that are taller, we could embed some design standards and design ambition in those kinds of approval policies from the very beginning. So I actually, although I, I don't wanna um, downplay how complicated it, uh, that will be to move through the very city departments, I, I see quite a bit of potential there actually. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christopher. I mean, it's already our time. Um, so thank you so much for uh, joining us today and for generously giving your time. And thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, great questions. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation. Um, Heather and I, you know, as we said, are members of ARDAC. Um, we're also hoping to have Christopher come back to the West Coast sometime in the near future so we can continue a conversation in person. Um, as far as other events coming up that may be of interest to people, uh, tonight the San Diego Architecture Foundation is having a pachakacha at uh, Studio E Architects that would be um, discussing urban transformations in San Diego. I'm sure we'll discuss many of these issues. Um, and we'll also be having a planning director symposium through UCSD um, on October 14th. So some events look forward to. <coughs> um, but yeah, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate you um, taking the time and sharing your work with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm just seeing this question in the chat. Yes, we, we are compensating folks in oh. the competition now. Um, and the 1871 is very much organized from that point of view, really being careful about uh, labor and limiting uh, what we ask people to do in the unpaid portion and really uh, setting aside money to compensate them uh, to flesh out the proposal. So absolutely, that's a, that's a key lesson I think I've learned um, in this position that we've tried to apply to all the projects we do along those lines. So I just wanted to sneak that one in because I just saw <laughs> no, Thank you. I know we couldn't get all right. to them all, but appreciate No, that. I appreciate the question. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much for great questions um, and, and uh, 
I've really enjoyed it. Great. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.